Good morning. Lovely to see you all. The family of God. It's good to be with the family of God again. Um, and we know that the Lord is here with us, which is uh, a wonderful truth. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today are some very familiar words that I'm sure you've heard preached on a number of times. But I think it's a good thing to get refreshed again uh, with these familiar words and perhaps explore them a bit and uh, allow them to comfort us and to help us um, because everyone uh, needs comfort and help one time or another in their life as life can be difficult um, and we think particularly this morning about our dear brother and sister Bryn and Chrissy who are going through a bit of a difficult time right now um, and we are assured that the Lord is with them and he's upholding them and looking after them and he'll bring them through this trial so we trust the Lord for that. Okay, so we are looking at John 14. Um, but before I start, I want to just start with a kind of an existential question. A number of existential questions that human beings will ask of themselves in all places, in all times, doesn't matter what they believe in, at one time or another, we and uh, most other people will have asked ourselves these questions. What is the truth? Who am I? Where am I going? How do I live for now in a right way? Where do I go when I die? These questions have burdened the heart of human beings from time immemorial. And they're life and death questions. So I want to give you a reminder of a firm anchor that will uh, hold us and provide answers to these existential questions. Sometimes this anchor I'm going to talk about today will help us against lies and confusion. And as we go into uh, election time, and we're in election time right now, sometimes I might think, it's hard to find an honest guy out there or woman. If I look at what's happening on the media, bless them, I'm sure there are some really honest and decent candidates. But you know, politics is a bit of a game. And uh, the best of them can sometimes bend the truth just a little bit to get their point over. So we live in a confusing world full of deceit and deception. And we need an anchor to help us hold fast and keep our, our way in the right way. So a bit of context now. So Jesus and his disciples are on towards the end of the Last Supper. This has been a bit of a bumpy meal, if I'm honest. If I was there, I might have been at times comforted, always because Jesus was with me. But maybe a bit of indigestion once in a while, because think of what had just happened. Judas had just been allowed out. He's gone, just left the room to go and do his terrible deed. Peter had just been told that he would betray Jesus three times. And Jesus had told his disciples he's going away. So you can imagine the turmoil in their hearts. And they didn't really understand fully what he was talking about. And he says these words, Let not your hearts be troubled. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. So they were concerned, they were anxious, they were in turmoil, they wanted clarity and certainty, and he doesn't tell them everything, but he reveals something about his purpose for leaving them to go and prepare a place for them, their future home in heaven. And um, at one point in the future, the new heavens and the new earth will be their future home. He's providing, along with a father, a mansion for them to live in, or a wonderful place. We don't really know what that will be, but it will be wonderful. So this is his purpose for leaving them. So that should reassure them a little bit. He doesn't do anything for a, without a good reason. And he also assures them that one day he will return for them. 
he will come back to gather them. So, and this is what he also promises for us. For us too, we have uncertain, troublesome times in our lives. And Jesus has promised us that he's gone to prepare a place for us. And that also he will come back for us. And if we believe his words, he should give us our hearts some rest. He will return for his church, rescuing us from a world of pain and confusion. But you know, one of the greatest parts of this promise is that he says we will be with him. The most important thing is that we will be where Jesus is. And that doesn't matter in a sense where that is, as long as it's with Jesus. He is the goal and reward of our faith. And to be with Jesus is the most exciting and glorious promise that a Christian can have. It doesn't matter where we are, as long as we're with him. Now, many of us have had loved ones that went away for a period, and they said, well, I'll come back, and some of them have not come back. They failed us. Jesus will never, ever give that sort of weak promise. His promise is absolutely firm. What he says, he will do. He will do. Then we have Thomas um, being reasonably blunt as usual. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Now, Thomas, of course, is asking for a literal roadmap to the end destination so he can have a safe, secure journey. But instead... Jesus speaks of a relationship. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father but by me. He's pointing out that he himself is the way. And of course, all wrapped up in this is the truth that only through Jesus can we be saved. He's the only way to get to the Father. So salvation is exclusively in Christ. So these three um, things, the way, the truth, and the life, are intimately linked. But what I want to do is just to unwrap them a little bit separately. So um, we will start with the way. So Jesus is the way. So let's go back to our existential questions. Where am I going? Where am I going to end up? Is my existential question as a human being. So these um, become these questions become more intense as life difficulties hit us. And we think about people that perhaps don't know the Lord. These questions are very deep. Um, what do I do? What happens when I die? If I'm an atheist, am I, as I believe, really just a bunch of cells illuminated by electricity? And when I die, I just get turned off. And essentially, that's annihilation. I don't exist anymore. Will I get reborn into another body, as a Buddhist might say, or a Hindu? Uh, is heaven and hell just a fantasy that people have told me to scare me? So these are the questions that people that have not met the Lord have. So that Jesus presents his answer. He says, I'm the way. I'm the way that will safely get you to a real place in eternity where you'll be really safe. It's him opposed to, as opposed to an idea or a philosophy. It's a person, the way. So if you find that you are losing your way or if you've not found it yet, look to him and you will find the way and you will find your way again if you've stepped off it. Salvation, he says, is exclusively in him and no one else. And to follow him is to follow the way. And to follow him is to stay on the way. It's interesting to remember that the early Christians were called followers of the way, not Christians. It's only in Antioch later that they were called Christians, meaning little Christs. But they were first called followers of the way. So this was a big, important idea or concept for the early church. It was vital to them. Matthew 7, 14 says, Straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. We know that the cross is the entrance to life. This is the gate. Only through the cross can you receive life. And to follow Jesus is apart from every other teacher or so-called God, and few find this truth. It's important to note that there is no agreement between this way and other ways. It is impossible that they all lead to the same place. 
today in the religious pluralistic society we have, which has some blessings, you know, we are very tolerant of each other usually in this society. Um, but it does claim pluralism that all ways lead to the same place or all ways are equally valid. And any exclusive truth claim is intolerant. So to say someone that Jesus is the only way is considered intolerance. But of course, they don't realize the pluralists that they are making an exclusive truth claim. They are saying all ways are valid. That's exclusive. It's become a dogma. It's important to know that there can be no peace between the way of Jesus and other ways. 2 Corinthians 6 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Now the way of lawlessness is the wrong path. And fellowship with unbelievers will inevitably lead you off this true way. I once was in mission work on the mission field and we were building a team to help us reach out to a very needy group of people. And me and my core team decided that anyone that helped in the work should be baptized. That was the criterion, we, one of the criteria we chose. They should be baptized. Um, I relented with one person who seemed to be a faithful Christian and wanted desperately to be part of the work. And it, it ruined the work. It did not work because I, we were unweak, equally yoked. A dear, dear person, dearly beloved of us, but not quite in the right place. Not with the same weight on their shoulders as we were carrying. And eventually, the only time this cleared up was when she was baptised and came to real living faith. And then we managed to work together. No peace between the way of Jesus and other ways. Now we come to our second statement by Jesus. He is the truth. And we know that Jesus is God incarnate. God, from all eternity, is God and cannot tell a lie. Numbers 23 says, God is not human that he should tell a lie, not a human that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and then not fulfill? Jesus is a truth incarnate. We know that Jesus is the truth, not a truth or half a truth, well, the whole truth, to quote something that's quoted in corporates all over the land. His word is truth. Psalm 119 says, The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. This truth, that is Jesus, will set you free from sin. John 8.32 And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So he made that statement, by the way, after a confrontation with the Pharisees. And he was making this statement to the Jews who said... They believed on him and they were offended and they were meant to be believers, by the way, and they were offended because he was saying that they were enslaved to sin and he would set them free. And they rejected this. It's important to remember this fact that no truth is in the devil and lies are from the devil. John says this, this is Jesus speaking again. You are of the father, your devil, and want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he's speaking from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. So people are deceived by Satan to reject truth. But Satan deceives very carefully. He deceives by changing God's word, by warping it, emitting parts of it or adding to it. Therefore, his teachers the people that follow him and our false teachers do the same thing. They usually mix some truth with a, with a lie, thus poisoning it. The lie is smuggled in with a load of truth so it remains undetected. If you take a glass of nice, clean, fresh water to drink it, it will do you good. One tiny drop of arsenic or another poison, that same water will kill you. So you what he does, he sneaks a little lie in with the truth, and so, so there he deceives people. You know, it seems to me, if you look at the Old Testament, for instance, that God hates mixture. 
He hates what we call admixture and he loves purity and wholeness. Leviticus warns the Jews, the Israelites, you shall not yet let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. That wasn't about material and seeds and beasts. It was about a wholeness of heart and a dedication and worship to Jehovah that was wholehearted and cut off anything else. No mixture would be allowed in. Now coming back to Jesus, he knew that his disciples would soon face difficulties in the area of doctrine or truth. He knew that the Jewish and Roman authorities would soon challenge them, asking them testing questions, and some would end up on trial and die for their faith. In fact, most of the disciples, of course, did. They would need to know the truth they stood for. Of course, that is the person of Jesus, and they did. But he assured that the Holy Spirit would return and teach them and then bring them into all truth, as the scriptures say. The truth is a good foundation that can't be shaken. So they had the foundation of knowing him, the truth, and of knowing the word of God. I imagine, I think, by the time they ended up, the end of Jesus' three years with them, they probably knew a lot of the scriptures. I can't imagine that he wouldn't have referred to them constantly. Um, so we need that foundation, both in the person that we know and the scriptures that we know. Because we too will be questioned about our faith and we will need to make a good defence. And I'd like to note this, there can be no peace between truth and lies. 2 Corinthians 16 says, What agreement has a temple of God with idols? We are the temple of God, you see, and we cannot agree with any false truth or any false religion or philosophy at all. And in verse 5, it says, What communion has light with darkness? Lies are darkness. They attempt to circumnavigate the truth, warp it, hide it, or extinguish it. The truth is light. Psalm 119 reminds us of this. And it says these famous words, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now finally we're going to move to Jesus' life. So he is the life. Now perhaps if we wonder about how we to live, we go back to our existential questions. How am I to live a right life? How am I to be alive? You know, without Christ we are born dead in our sins. And we're spiritually dead. And the Lord makes us alive. It's only him that can do that. Jesus is the source of life, without which life would be intolerable. And we, as Christians, should be living for him and in him. Paul reflects on this when he says, just before his possible martyrdom, he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So Paul didn't mind where he went, as long as he was with Jesus, like I said before. His whole desire was to be with his Lord, life or death. Life can never be extinguished by death. Only God gives life. And if we go back to the creation, life does not happen on its own. It's not possible that life can come from matter, time and chance. It will never, ever happen. Life has to come from life. Remember that Jesus is... is saying all the time to his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And we know that Jesus was the word of God, the creative word in the beginning when the word was created. In Genesis 2, 7, it says this, and God, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. So life comes from Jesus, physical life. This body can't be alive unless Jesus had sustaining it, because somewhere in the scriptures it says he also sustains the world. Let's remember that death does not come from God, but from Satan. In Genesis 3, Satan deceived Eve with these words, you shall not surely die. And of course, we know what happened with that, don't we? She did die, and Adam did. The first murder was inspired by Satan. The deaths of the prophets were inspired by Satan. Satan deceived Judas to betray Jesus. There can be no peace between God and death. There is permanent enmity between God and death. Matthew 22, Jesus said of the Father, I am the God 
of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And he was pointing towards the eternal life that those three saints of the Old Testament had. Hosea 13, 14 says, I will ransom them, that means us, from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Revelation 21 says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So Jesus is the enemy of death, and one day death will be overcome and thrown into the lake of fire, where the false prophet the same are. Jesus gives a spiritual life. Now this is um, important for us as Christians to remind ourselves of this truth. To become a Christian and to see heaven, you must be born again. New life must come into you because you're a dead person, effectively. You look alive, you're walking and talking, but spiritually you have no life in you. Jesus gives us life. He said this, Most assuredly I say to you, he, he who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. And Jesus reminds us again in John, most assuredly he says, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. And Romans, Paul reminds us this in Romans, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What a wonderful thing that we can expect our mortal bodies, these poor, old, shaggy, broken, aching things. I'm not speaking about the young people in the room because they don't know that truth yet about getting old. One day we'll have a new body and we will be with the Lord. A wonderful thing to think about. So the God of life dwells in us. Isn't that amazing? Remember, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. Jesus said he was the temple of the Holy Spirit before uh, the cross and his resurrection. And because of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, we now have the privilege of being the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the God of life dwells inside us. How then can we have any part of death? So to recap, if you don't know the way, or even where you want to go, look to Jesus. There's no map needed, just a person. Get to know Jesus more and more, and you won't get off the way. You'll stay on it. Cling to him. Stay on the way, and don't deviate. You know, if I'm looking for directions, if I'm in a strange city, and I'm wandering around like Joseph, the dreamer, wandering in the fields, which has frequently happened to me, and I don't know where I am, I ask a stranger for directions, and they can show me a map. Yeah, I'll probably remember some of that, but probably not a lot of it. Uh, they'll tell me some directions. I'll say, go down the street, turn left, turn the second right. There's no chance I'll remember any more than two things. Absolutely no chance. But the best thing they could do is to say to me, listen, I'll take you there. Right, just come, come with me and I'll take you there over to the place you need to be. If they accompany me, I'm absolutely guaranteed I'm going to get there. And I don't have to do much thinking even, which is great for me. You know, the Lord does that for us. He accompanies us on the way because he is the way. But he'll also be with us on the way. If you don't know the truth or even what is true, look to Jesus because he is the truth. Believe in his word. Speak his truth out, Christians. Don't be deceived. Satan is a snake when he deceives. Resist the deceiver. He will clear your confusion. 1 Corinthians says, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, uh, as in all the churches of saints. If you're feeling dead spiritually, look to Jesus, the life. Spend time with the Lord, he will refill you with his life. Spend time in his word, and his life will pour into you afresh, and you'll be strengthened in that life. 
Jesus is still the way, the truth and the life. His whole life was planned out to get to the cross and die for you. If you were the only person living, he would still have died for you. If there was no one else in existence, the Lord would have still died for you. Ultimately, everyone wants to know those existential questions have answers and they can only be answered in Christ, in the Lord Jesus. And most of all, most joyous and wonderful thing, whatever happens to us, if we are with him, it doesn't matter. The main thing of our faith is to be with the Lord. And I just want to finish with some words from Ephesians. Just to close our thoughts off. Final words in Ephesians says this, Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And I like the translation that says, with all sincerity. Thank you.